starting session 20. <laughs> We've got either five or six more sessions to go, and we'll be done with Genesis. So let's pray, and we'll jump in. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this new day. We thank you for your blessings. We thank you for bringing Greta and Bonnie back and restoring their health to the place where they can get out and about a little bit. And we just pray that this time together this morning would be a blessing to them. We thank you for uh, Valerie and Sue who have been able to come almost every time. And, um, thank you for them. And we just pray, Father, that you would just bless all of us as we gather around your yes. word and as we strive to see Christ and glimpses of him and um, what his character is like as we study these families and individuals within them. So we just ask now your blessing in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right, and we will start with the Minor Prophets. So, now I haven't reviewed them myself. Let's just see, can we say them up to... Uh, I think we've studied nine so far, or at least we've been looking at three groups. Or so let's. So we start out with Hosea, Hosea Joel, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Jonah Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, and Zephaniah. 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 Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. Well. Um, on the timeline, so we're looking at Nahum today, and on the timeline, he's number five. So you can write his name. Let's see, Bonnie, did you get one of these timelines? Yeah, I did, and I filled it out, but I, I didn't want to carry a whole bunch of stuff, so yeah. I left it at home. That's fine. But okay. I did do it. Okay. So I'll Nahum is... <laughs> <laughs> okay. It's number five, and, and his date is 660 B.C. Now, as far as the map, you're going to need that second map because like Jonah, he was given a message for Nineveh and the Assyrians. So get out this map and find Nineveh and somewhere in the vicinity. As I got to looking at that, I thought I should have whited out an area or something because the heads tend to get lost. Well, let's go to the uh, lecture notes now, and we're ready for the second paragraph, Nahum's message. And I, the uh, Women's Bible Study had a very good, succinct description of that. She said uh, They said that Nahum was God's messenger to announce the fall of Nineveh and the complete overthrow of Assyria. Nahum's book is a sequel to and a dramatic contrast with the book of Jonah. We say it's a sequel to because both Jonah and Nahum had messages specifically for Nineveh and the Assyrians. But there's a contrast. Jonah lived a hundred years earlier, and when he went with his message, the people listened to it, they responded, they repented, and God did not bring destruction. Okay. A hundred years goes by, and in that hundred years, either, another, well, obviously it's another generation of people, but they have turned away, they have forgotten that, or else they said, ah, eh, no judgment came, big deal, you know. Whatever reason, they turned away, and this time God is saying, all right, judgment is coming, and this time there is no escape. You have crossed the line, and there is no escape. It is coming. And um, it did come in 612 BC. So Nahum's speaking around 660. So about 40 years later, 30 or 40 years later, the Babylonians came against Assyria and just utterly took it over. And Assyria never rose to power again like they had been. So interesting concepts in Nahum's book. Well, the very first verse, uh, shows us something unusual. It has a double title for the book. Um, the first title is The Oracle of Nahum. 
what's an oracle? That's an odd word. That's, it can mean two things, two related things. It could mean a prophetic utterance. So in other words, these are the prophecies of Nahum. Or it can also mean the person who gives those things. It's like prophet and prophecy sound alike. Well, oracle is the same word, but it can be both a noun for the person or a noun for the message of the person. But then he says, um, the vision that God gave to Nahum. Well, that tells us how uh, Nahum got his message, that it came in a vision that God gave him. So, I think, though, this is the only book that has a double title like that, but for whatever reason. Okay, then, uh, there, Nahum is a short little book. It's only three chapters long. So, and the first verse just tells you what it is. It's his prophecy concerning Nineveh. But then in verses 2 through 8 of chapter 1, we find a description of the Lord. Uh, it's a kind of psalm or song about him. But if you look at it, there's some very contrasting thoughts within it. Um, and I brought my wrong Bible. I have the other Bible when you mark. I'll get there. Okay. <clears throat> So let's just read through verses 2 through 8. You can kind of follow along as I read. The Lord is a jealous and avenging God. The Lord takes vengeance and is fierce in wrath. The Lord takes vengeance against his foes. He is furious with his enemies. That's verse 2. What big thought comes out in that verse? God's really upset. God is really upset. <laughs> yeah. That's the understatement of the year. <laughs> he, and vengeance, vengeance. He's furious, avenging, you know. He's fierce in wrath. The next verse says, the Lord is slow to anger. Now, does that seem like, wait a minute. Yeah, like it's an oxymoron. Like an oxymoron. <laughs> but the point is, the Lord is slow to anger. So if he's this angry, he's had a lot of provocation and he's put up with sin and put up with sin and put up with sin until it's reached its limit and then when it's reached its limit his his wrath will be fierce but he is so <coughs> anger he didn't just suddenly get that mad after two minutes of provocation okay so you get these two seemingly contradictory pictures of the Lord, and yet it tells you something about how great the offense was of the Assyrians against this holy God. Um, so it goes on, the Lord is slow to anger, but great in power. He will never leave the guilty unpunished. His path is in the whirlwind and storm, and clouds are the dust beneath his feet. He rebukes the sea so that it dries up, and he makes all the rivers run dry. Bashan and Carmel wither, and even the flower of Lebanon withers. The mountains quake, and the earth melt, and the earth trembles in his presence. Okay, it's been talking about the Lord is great in power. Now we're getting all these examples from nature that show that. He's in whirlwinds, he's in floods, he's in earthquakes and all these things, that he's the one that allows them and causes them. Um, who can withstand his indignation? So is that why we're having so much trouble now? God's just, his anger is increasing? It, to the floods and the tornadoes? And it could be. I want to be careful because it's not always a judgment, you know, but we know that America is on a path away from God and he won't allow her to keep on going and keep on going. And certainly, if it's not judgment, it's like a warning. And we know that he uses things like that that, that will draw some people back to him. They right. may consider their path and their life and the fact that their life could be snuffed out. You know, if they survived the tornado last Christmas, 
that gives them another opportunity, you know. So, but we do know that a time is coming that will definitely be judgment and there will be no question then. You know, just like he left no question now. This is judgment that's coming. And I'm telling you ahead of time. So what Nahum is doing is describing this God, but this is not some little wimpy guy. This is a God that when he says he's going to do something, he has the power to do it. You need to fear him, you know? Um, and it's like, who can withstand his indignation? Who can endure his burning anger? And the implication is nobody. <laughs> you know, if he comes against you, you're toast. <laughs> um, even rocks are shattered before him. But then it changes tone again, and it says, The Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of distress. He cares for those who take refuge in him. But he will completely destroy Nineveh with an overwhelming flood. So it's like Nahum was speaking comfort to Israel, or specifically to Judah. Israel has already gone into captivity now. But um, he's speaking warning, fierce warning to the enemies of God's people. So he has messages for both. And it's not that God has these contradictory aspects to him, but of course his attitude is very different toward his own people than it is toward the ones that come against him to harm them. So comfort for God's people, here's warning for those who are not God's people. And then the whole rest of the book from there on is giving in detail some of the specific um, types of judgment that Nineveh and the rest of Assyria is going to suffer. And he takes him from the king on down. He talks about what's going to happen to the palace and so on. So a, a sobering book, and yet always God gives hope for his people. Okay, um, so we'll look at the very last paragraph under that, on the part on Nahum. It says, it's also interesting to note the meaning of Nahum's name. Nahum means comfort. And as we said, his message would have been a great comfort to the people of Judah. After all, they had seen the northern kingdom go into captivity. And they thought, we could be next. <laughs> We're on the, the target list, you know. But um, it would have been a comfort to him, to them, to know that God was going to deal with their enemies. Okay, so that uh, completes that. Um, for next week, we're going to look at the book of Habakkuk. So you can read about that in your little book and anywhere else that you find notes. But I, switching gears now to Joseph and Jacob and their story, <clears throat> I thought the Bible Study Fellowship had some interesting comments, so I wanted to share those with you. Uh, when Joseph's brothers came to him the first time, remember it says he spoke, he pretended that he didn't know who they were, called them spies, and he spoke very harshly to them. It says, we, we're going to study Joseph's continued testing of his brothers through several encounters before he reveals who he is. His harsh treatment of his brothers is not explained in scripture anywhere that I know of. But he appears purposeful in putting them into situations that expose their hearts. By seeing God work through many trials, Joseph had learned to trust God's sovereign control over negative circumstances. He could trust that God was working for the good of his people, and God awakened the brothers' consciences through three days in prison and fear for their lives. I mean, they probably wondered if they were going to be you know, spies were executed. <laughs> they probably wondered if any of them were going to survive and then what would happen to their family starving back in Canaan. Uh, Jacob's response to the issue of sending Benjamin to Egypt, remember, he didn't send him on this first trip and he definitely didn't want to send him on the second. It says Jacob initially resisted the idea of sending Benjamin to Egypt with the nine older sons. 
But finally he yielded and gave permission for Benjamin to go because he didn't see any other alternative. <clears throat> he sent a lavish gift, but most importantly, he sought the mercy of Almighty God on behalf of Benjamin and his other sons. He recognized that only God could protect them from the man. That's how they kept saying, mm -hmm. the man kept called us spies. The man wouldn't let us come back without you know, the man, the man. And uh, it, what he says is recorded, as for me, if I'm bereaved, I'm bereaved. But the literal translation doesn't express doubt or fatalism, but recognition that the matter is now in God's hands, and God will control the outcome, and he can do as he wishes. Yielding to God often requires letting go of control and comfort and even of things held dear. Faith grows as we trust God in ways that feel costly. Okay, and then the, uh, the second time when they go back, and they're not thrown in prison, but they're actually invited to dinner, and you think, wow, you know, dinner at uh, second in command over all Egypt, you know. But what it did, it raised their suspicions. And they were sure that Joseph planned to accuse them of theft because of the money that was in their bags after their last trip. He says, he wants to attack us and overpower us and seize us as slaves. Interestingly, that's exactly what they had done to their own brother. So they think this is going to happen to them. That's the first thing that comes to their mind. That's what he's going to do to us. And they don't even know it's Joseph, but we're going to suffer the fate that we inflicted on him. So God uses that to arouse their conscience and their guilt. And then the steward's assurance. The steward quickly reassured the brothers they were not being accused of stealing. He treated them with the hospitality offered to guests, not as suspects, and certainly not as prisoners. They prepared their gifts to present to Joseph when he arrived at noon, and they expected harsh treatment, like they got from him the first time they came. But instead, they received kindness, this lavish meal. They seem to be kept guessing, on guard, and evaluating what's going to happen next. God used both the unexpected hardship and the surprising kindness to awaken their consciences. So that by the time Joseph reveals himself, reconciliation can begin to happen between these brothers that had never, never been at peace with each other from the time Joseph was born, probably. So we will look more at that. But I just thought they had interesting insights into this. And uh, so I wanted to share those with you. So with that, let's go to the homework. Okay, I think I will read my summaries, and if you have anything to add, we'll pause after each one. So on page 144, uh, chapter 42, I have that Jacob sends 10 of his sons to Egypt to buy grain, keeping Benjamin with him for safekeeping. Joseph recognized them, but they don't know him, and he keeps Simeon and tells him to bring Benjamin as proof of their honesty. Anybody have anything to add to that? Or? I had noted Joseph's dream comes true. Yep. His brothers go to Egypt and bow down to him. Yes. Literally came true. And remember the first dream he had was only about the brothers. The second dream had the sun, the moon, you know, the parents bowing down to him. And that's what happened when Jacob came. All right, chapter 43. I had at Judah's insistence, the brothers returned to Egypt with Benjamin. Once again, their guilt makes them fearful, but Joseph honors them with a meal at his house. Anybody have anything to add to that one? Okay. Chapter 44 was Judah's, I thought, beautiful plea for Benjamin. 
Judah offering to take his own place as Joseph's slave. So, and then chapter 45, Joseph reveals himself to his brothers and promises to care for all their families. And then, to me, there was a significant detail in verse 15 of chapter 45. Um, it says at, at the end of the meal, let's see if I can find it. Okay, uh, verses 14 and 15. So Joseph has revealed himself at the meal, and Joseph throws his arms around Benjamin and wept, and Benjamin wept on his shoulder. Joseph kissed each of his brothers, and afterward his brothers talked with him. Do you remember what it said about their relationship when Joseph was a young boy? They could not speak peaceably with him. And now they're fellowshipping. I just thought that was significant. I never made that connection before. But now they're able to talk to him. God has cleared the way and cleared the air so that they can have that relationship. Okay, then chapter 46. Jacob's entire family moves to Egypt and God reassures him about it. I uh, mean, reassures Jacob. Don't be afraid to go to Egypt. Why, why do you think that would be? Why would Jacob have been afraid to go to Egypt? Because all of their experience in the past. Okay, when Abraham went to Egypt, God said, you know, you need to go home. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. this is bad. And then Isaac tries to go to Egypt, and God actually intervenes and doesn't allow that to happen. So, yeah, he probably had questions. And God wanted them to stay in the promised land. Right, exactly. So he would have had good reason to fear, but God reassured him. He said, oh, it's okay. This, this is part of my plan for you to go now. Um, okay. And then I thought it was interesting that Judah was the one that was sent ahead to prepare. You know, it's... It's one thing to go to buy grain, but if you're going down there to live, you gotta start looking around for housing and all of that, you know. And then uh, chapter 47, <clears throat> Jacob's family is treated royally by Pharaoh himself. Pharaoh acquire, uh, acquires the people of Egypt and the land of Egypt for himself, and Jacob asks to be buried in Canaan. I'm willing to come here and live, but when I die, you take my bones back home and bury me there. <clears> hey, <throat> okay, anybody have anything to add to those last couple of things? Mm -hmm. All right, well, let's go on into day two. What did you notice about Jacob's attitude toward the sons of Leah and his concubines and, his, and the son of Rachel? And I, oh yeah, go ahead. Well, it kind of treats them like servants. Like, you go on ahead, you know, that's fine. You you go get the grain. And Benjamin stays here. I don't want anything to happen to him. If something happens to you, well, okay. Yeah. But, they are expendable. Yeah. And Benjamin, <laughs> Benjamin is, is not. not. Yes. Yeah, I, I put he loves Rachel's sons much more. Yes. Yes, and he's made that very obvious to everyone. And I also wondered, do you think he harbored suspicions? I think he did. That the older boys knew more than they were telling him about what happened to Joseph, and he thought, I don't know that he's going to be safe in their company. Yes. Let alone, you know, from bandits or what else could befall you on a trip. Yeah, maybe Benjamin won't come back. Right, right. Yeah. So anyway, um, Okay, then question three. She asked you to read this verse or set of verses in both the NIV and the ESV. And how does the NIV enhance your understanding? Um, I think the ESV says he treated them like strangers. And the and NIV. Well, yeah, it also said that he recognized them. He recognized but them. But NIV says immediately he recognized them. Mm -hmm. Okay. And the NIV also says he pretended to be a stranger yes. to them. So he knew exactly what he was doing. Um, 
explain why do you think that Joseph reacts to his brothers the way he does and why does he decide to deceive them I mean we're not really told but I think because they don't he don't remember him at all okay yeah. they don't remember him at all I yeah, think they wanted to see what or he wanted to see what their hearts were like now yes and also I think he wanted to see his father and this would be a way to manipulate things to see his father and his own younger brother yeah. yes so um, anyway now that raises another interesting question he recognizes them immediately why do you think it was that they didn't recognize him because God didn't want them to recognize it at that point. Well, that could be, but the, are there, some, there may be some other... He was a young, young. he was a child he was when he was sold into yeah. slavery, and now he is a grown man. He's okay, thirty. and I think that's part of it. His appearance has changed, yes. He lived as an Egyptian. He lived and dressed. Have you ever seen yeah, films true. of the Egyptians? A lot of times it shows yeah. like their heads are shaved. He would have looked very different from the way he looked back in Israel. You know, and they aren't expecting to see him. You don't see what you don't expect. You know what I mean? They're expecting to see some very high authority, and that's exactly what they saw. And the other thing is, I thought well, maybe his voice would have given him away, but you realize he spoke through an interpreter. When right. you're reading in the scripture, it just sounds like they're having this conversation back and forth. No, he's speaking. I was going to bring Tom, and we were going to do a little demonstration of it. I just thought of it this morning. I thought, well, I haven't planned it through. I better not spring this on anybody. <laughs> but, you know, so they didn't actually get to hear his voice that much. You know, and maybe he's speaking very quietly to the interpreter. And, you know, the interpreter is actually going and talking to them. But anyway, I think there's a lot of things going on there. And, um, but yeah, he would have looked different sound, you know, and he was totally unexpected. Okay, uh, the ESV, when he, Joseph makes this accusation about being spies, uh, the ESV says, you've come to see the nakedness of the land. How does the NIV translate that? Land unprotected? Land unprotected. You've seen where we're weak. So that's what spies do they look for the weak points, you know, so we'll know where to attack. And for proof that they're not spies, I thought it was an odd statement. We're all sons of one father. You know, we're all brothers. What does that have to do with being spies? Isn't it unusual for that many boys to be in one family? Mm. Well, probably not. I mean, I think families were large, eventually, anyway, in Israel. Um, somebody. Usually, as spies, um, it would be one person per family that they would send out, not all from one right. family. Right, you wouldn't send your whole family, you know, that, that maybe they'd all get wiped out. Or usually spies, I mean, one family wouldn't be coming against Egypt. I mean, you know, Egypt's got this whole army and 12 men are going <laughs> to, you know. And like even when Moses in his day sent out 12 spies, it was one from mm -hmm. each tribe. So there was this whole confederation of people. So when they're saying we're sons of one of one father, you know, we're, we're one family that's come here to get food because we're starving, you know. So I think that's what it has to do with. Now you're right, up to this point their families have not been that large. Their relatives' families have been. We saw Esau, how many kids he had and grandkids. Um, but anyway, um, so Joseph has this plan. He says, you're, you're going to have to stay here and we'll send one person back to get Benjamin. And what do you think was his motive for that? Uh, we've already talked about he wants to see them. He wants to see his dad and Benjamin. But what else do you think is going on? I wonder if he wanted to see them squirm because <laughs> of what they did to him. Do you think there might have been just a little <laughs> bit of... It could be. I mean, we're not told. But I think also he wants to know their attitude toward Benjamin. 
because he probably figures Benjamin also is favored, and he knows what happened to him because he was favored. Probably wants to know, do they still have that in them? Are they still going after the favorite children? You know? Oh, and just, he gave uh, Benjamin food from his table. Right, that, that's then, on the second trip, but yes, you're right. And not only did he give him food, he gave him five times as much. So he's kind of throwing in their face and really exaggerating the favoritism that, you know, is shown. And he wants to see, have they matured beyond <laughs> where they were when he last saw them. So, you know, and again, we're kind of guessing because we're not really told in Scripture exactly what was going on in his mind. But we do see how God used it to bring about, you know, to make them admit their guilt. I don't know if they've ever admitted it to each other. You know, I think it's been something they have pushed down and not talked about and refused to talk about over the, maybe they try not to even think about it over the years, you know, but now it comes up and they have to deal with it. And it's for their own good, really, because until we confess, we can't turn away and we can't really begin to, to deal with things. Okay, she says, what in, in verse question eight? What emotion causes Joseph to weep? I think there's probably one thing there's one emotion. Glad gladness. Gladness. Mm -hmm. Okay. Maybe release. Have you ever had a something that's caused you a lot of tension and strain, and then when it's kind of resolved, you weep, but it's not because you're sad about it. It's just let <laughs> you go. Let them go. Yeah. He probably hadn't thought about it in so long because of everything else going on in his life and all of a sudden here it is, all these emotions at once. Yes, yes. And seeing them in face, face to face, that would have been a very emotional thing for him. You know. And especially not knowing what's their attitude now. <laughs> what's you know, what are they like? So yeah. Okay. Um, let's go into question 10. Because uh, I thought this was kind of interesting. Okay, when the boys or the men go back with the grain, uh, they gave this report. And uh, it says, what do you think about that report that they gave? How would you characterize it, especially compared to other reports they've given to their father? This time they told the truth. Whoa, this time they told the truth. And this time, did you notice, they went into blow by blow. I mean, they gave complete, the, the man said this, and so we did this, and then the man said this, and so we did this, and then he did this. And, you know, it's like they didn't leave a single detail out. So I just went back, I just wanted to see what the report was when they came to their father after they had sold Joseph. And it was very interesting. Their report was about one sentence long. See, can you identify this room? No. That was it. They didn't say one more word. You know, it would have been dangerous to, you know, because they might have told 10 slightly different tales, you know. That's true. You know, you have to make sure your lies match so that you just don't say anything, you know. But this time, they didn't need to fear that, so they could just tell them the truth, the whole truth, and they did, you know. Blow by blow, word by word almost. And then we see chapter, or question 11. How did Jacob respond to the proposal that they wanted to take Benjamin back? I mean, besides the fact that he resisted it. But what did he say? It was all about me. It's all about me. My children, yeah. all against me. Yeah, yeah. So uh, he said that before at Shechem when they've slaughtered all these people. You've brought trouble for me. You know? So he's still he's still Jacob, even though he's matured in a lot of ways. Now it's interesting. Both Reuben and Judah offered to kind of take Benjamin's place. And Reuben says, you know, lead and trust Benjamin to me. 
you know, let it fall on me if something happens to him. And Jacob won't do it. Why do you think that was? Why did he listen to Judah but not Reuben? Well, Reuben had to um, have sex with his concubine, so he he had proved that he's not really loyal to his father, to his feelings, or to, um, I can't think of the word, um, I can't think of the word. Okay. <laughs> okay. Just things that are supposed to happen, um, like with a marriage, a certain procedure. Yeah. Right, right. He wasn't <laughs> waiting for the appointed time, you know. I one of you is yeah. going to say something. He didn't respect his father's authority. Mm -hmm. And I, I think, too, that that issue had never apparently been resolved between the two of them. You know? Yeah. So when things are unresolved, it just causes ongoing problems. Mm -hmm. Whereas Judah, um, he, he probably, Reuben had um, done this to him, so Judah was next in line to inherit. Yeah, he was actually number four. Oh, we talked okay. about, we talked about yes. this, I think, last week. Reuben had sinned by adultery, but the next two were the ones that were responsible for murdering all those people at Shechem. That's true, yeah, I remember So that. Judah is the next yeah. one after them, and he has had a heart attitude change. We saw that in the previous chapter with Tamar, that he realized his guilt and his shortcomings. And I have a feeling it also affected other wrongs in his life, yes. But Reuben, being the oldest, was also or should have been responsible for Joseph way back when. Mm -hmm. Something happened to Joseph. Yeah. Reuben, okay. where were you? What were Reuben, you doing? Reuben wanted to be the inheritor and he yes, could have needed Joseph. I, I get all that. Instead. But here's, here's Dad saying, why would I entrust another son to you, basically, right. yeah. if you couldn't take care of the first one? Mm -hmm. Right. Right. Well, was Judah the second son of Leah? No, he was the fourth. Uh, there was Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah. So they had different mothers. Simeon, oh, no, they had the same mother. Oh, okay. All right. So she had, I think. There's so many. <laughs> I, I know. I'm trying to think. I think she had four sons, and then she, uh, then and Rachel and gave her a concubine yeah. so that she could get a son through her concubine. And then Leah had gave her concubine, and then she had more sons. So it's like you know, let's let's marry the <laughs> Anyway, okay. Well, let's go on to day three and look at some of those questions. And uh, what causes Jacob to urge his sons to go to Egypt again? Well, they obviously they had run out of the food. They had eaten up all the... They had really no choice. They had no That's choice. they all died. Yeah. And so, once again, as Jen Wilkin has been telling us, look for Judah. And he's the one that comes up and says, look, we've got to go back. And I will be surety, you know, for Benjamin. And he says, we're all going to die if we don't go back. So you're going to lose Benjamin anyway. Let me take care of him. And I will take the guilt forever if anything happens to Benjamin. And um, Jacob was willing then. And he his own ha has his own heart changed. Okay, so be it. God, I give him into your hands. You know. So um, we've already discussed number 15, that they, the brothers think that they're going to suffer the same fate that they caused their brother years before. And, um, how about question 16? What significant act occurs in 43 verse 26? He seated them according to age. Okay, he did that. They bowed down. They bowed down. And that's significant. Yeah. Why? Because of that dream. Again, you know, it's not just once that they bowed down. They bowed down the first time they came. They bow down when they present the gift. You know, it's multiple times. And Benjamin, of course, receives a special treatment. 
And uh, how did Joseph greet him? What were his words to Benjamin? God be gracious to you, my son. Mm -hmm. It's almost like you're more than, you know, he didn't say my brother. It's like, but well, he would have been very young compared to Joseph. Um, he wept. And then we've already talked about the fact that <laughs> Benjamin gets five times as much and that he wanted to see if they still harbor resentment, the other brothers. Okay, and then uh, the very last question on page 150. What does their response to Joseph's little test reveal about the changing state of their hearts? Well, the ESV says they were married with Joseph. What did the NIV say? They drank. They feasted and drank freely with him. <laughs> my my Bible actually said they got intoxicated with him. You know, <laughs> I mean they were they were really partying with him, and not in a bad sense, but it's just like they were free at last to do that, to enjoy his company, and um, that's an amazing thing. When God does more than just bring peace, but when he brings actual joy in one another's company, you know, um, that's an amazing thing. God always does above and beyond what we can ask or imagine. And I think, think how much more so in heaven when we will have no hindrances our own sin will have all been cared for. The sins of everybody else around us will all be gone. And we will be completely and utterly free to enjoy each other. And I say, oh, <laughs> what a God we serve. And we see just a little foretaste of it here. We too are going to feast and drink freely with one another. I mean, we do it a little bit now in our fellowship dinners. Mm -hmm. It's like, wow. <laughs> what a fellowship dinner we have awaiting us. So. All right, so for next week, we'll answer the questions for days four and five. And look at the back book. <laughs>